Hi everyone. Okay, so I'm back with part two of the immune system. This one I'm actually going to be talking about the adaptive responses. Because remember we have two divisions. We have the innate and the adaptive response. So let's go ahead and get started and talk about these responses. Okay, so this was a diagram I showed in the innate response lecture. If we take a look here, um, I spoke about the innate. Those, in those include the first line and second line defenses. But this lecture, I'm going to talk more about the tailor-made immune defense. And that means we're looking at the adaptive or the specific immunities. So that's the third line defense. Now there are two divisions to the third line of defense. We have our cell-mediated immunity, so that includes our T cells. And then we have our antibody-mediated immunity, which includes our B cells, okay? So we're going to talk primarily about this side. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with our cell-mediated immunity. Remember, the cell-mediated immunity is talking about our T cell responses. All right, so before in the first lecture, when we spoke about the innate, there were some specific cells that were very important called the antigen-presenting cells. Remember, those includes the macrophages and also the dendritic cells, okay? Um, they have on their surface, this is a review, MHCs, major histocompatibility complexes, which are like ID cards. And they will display antigens or display proteins that's on the inside onto the surface. All right, so during antigen presentation, the interaction between the MHCs and the T cell receptors will trigger a response called co stimulation. Okay, co stimulation. So during co-stimulation, with the proper connections between the MHC and the T-cell receptor, the antigen-presenting cell can actually secrete um, chemicals called cytokines that can then act on the immature T-cells. And in this case, the immature T-cell can become activated um, to either be the active helper T-cells or... Um, or the mature active T cells and the mature cytotoxic T cells. Now, I'll talk about these um, cells in a little bit more details later, but I just want you to know that the innate system works along with the T cells to activate them. All right, so this is showing you T cell activation. So here we have um, our antigen presenting cell note is here by APC. And here is the antigen. This is showing you your major histocompatibility complex that is displaying a protein on the ID card. Now, remember I said that when um, their co-stimulation messages are right there, are spot on with the MHCs, and if it's something that's foreign on there, it will send out chemical signals to that inactive helper T cell to activate it. Another name for helper T cells are CD4. Because they have specific receptors called CD4 receptors on the surface. So if we take a look here, you see it's called CD4s because it has CD4 receptors. So the helper T cells are known as CD4 cells. All right, so same thing here with the cytotoxic T cells. Another name for them is CD8 cells. All right, so to go back to this diagram, so our helper T cells known as CD4 cells, once they have been activated by the antigen presenting cells, they can then go and do other things. So one thing helper T cells do, we're still talking about cell mediated, is activate B cells. And I'll talk about B cells a little bit more in detail. B cells are really important at making antibodies. They're the antibody producing cells. So the helper T cell will help um, activate B cells. Now active helper T cells will also go and activate other helper T cells, right? So that's more of a recruiting agent. And then the helper T cells when they're active can activate the other T cell type which is known as 
cytotoxic T cells, also known as killer cells or CD8 cells. Okay, so at the heart of this, remember the CD4 cells or the helper T cells, when they're active, are one of the most critical components of the adaptive immune system because they will activate all the other um, adaptive immune cells. Okay, so remember they can activate. Um, other helper T cells, they can activate B cells, and they can activate cytotoxic T cells. And remember who activates these um, helper T cells? The antigen presenting cells like the macrophages. So once again, this is showing you a little bit closer about that cell mediator response. I'm just beating this into the ground because this is really important. Here's your CD4 helper T cells. Here's your antigen presenting cell. Here's that major histocompatibility complex. And the CD4 cells have CD4 T cell receptors, okay? And that's what works along with that co-stimulation. All right, so once the helper T cell becomes activated, and they're activated by these cytokine chemicals that are secreted by the antigen presenting cell, they will start cloning themselves, and they too will send out chemicals. Now, there's, there's subsets of T helper cells. We have T helper cell 1, T helper cells 2, but depending on which subset we have, they will go ahead and activate the B cells or activate the helper T cells or cytotoxic T cells. And they're all done about by chemicals, okay? So that's how helper T cells actually work. Now, when we talk about how the cytotoxic T cells work, they're actually very important cells. So they too will become activated, but they're the ones that will be kind of looking at those MHC1 ID cards found on cells, okay? So if a cell is virally infected, or if they're a cancer cell, because they'll display cancer proteins, or if they're infected with an intracellular pathogen, intracellular pathogen, it will detect those structural changes or those antigens that's foreign on the MHC. Once they come in contact with that, then they can go ahead and destroy the cells. Remember, cytotoxic T cells were activated by the helpers up here. Remember that up here? All right, so once they um, attack the infected cells, this is what happens. The cytotoxic T cell produces enzymes called granzymes. So they're kind of shot out of the cytotoxic T cells to the infected cells and it allows proteins to be broken down inside the infected cells, causing them to lyse. So remember, those cytotoxic T cells are important. Those CD8 cells, same thing, are important at destroying um, virally infected cells, cancer cells, and intracellular pathogen cells, where um, they will send out granzymes to actually destroy. Those are the death signals. They kind of form a pore on the surface and send out their destroying chemicals. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at our humoral responses. So humoral responses, usually we're looking at B cells. B cells are an important um, division of the adaptive immunity. Okay, so this right here is showing you B cell activation. I'm going to first start off with this picture up here. So B cells have what's called B cell receptors on their surface. And the B cell receptors can actually detect antigens um, and display antigens onto the surface. So they too can sometimes be called antigen presenting cells because of this matter. All right, so when they're they come in contact with an antigen that fits perfectly um, or fits onto the receptor, the helper T cells, remember that's part of the cell mediated, that's active, that helper T cell, once again using that co-stimulation with the MHC, um, will actually cause cytokines to be released from the helper T cells and that will activate the B cells. Okay, so when B cells are activated, they become what's known as plasma cells. So just, you know, for your knowledge, 
the subset of helper cells that actually activate the B cells are called T helper cells too. But I mean, you don't need to know that because this is just the essentials right now. Okay, so this diagram right here is actually showing um, how the B cells can actually take in an antigen and process it. And once it processes it, it can actually display it on its MHC class too. All right, the helper T cells that you remember were activated before will then go ahead and send out chemicals, the cytokines, that can actually activate the B cells. And when the B cells are activated, they're now called plasma cells. All right, and the plasma cells would then send out antibodies, which I'll talk about later. So I just want to show you how you have the antigen being displayed on that MHCs um, that can actually help with the activation process. So just remember that helper T cells need to activate the B cells. Um, once they become active, they become plasma cells, and then they can secrete antibodies. Okay, this is just showing you a little closer up without all the other stuff there, showing you that helper T cell that has that T cell receptor that's recognizing that MHC um, class 2 with that actually has the antigen on it. And this co-stimulation process is really, really important because this will actually allow the helper T cell now to activate that B cell. Okay, so this is the structure of an antibody. Antibodies have another name known as immunoglobulin, or you can abbreviate it as Ig. Okay, so there's two portions to the antibody, well, two general regions. So here we have our variable portion, the ones that's kind of that purple lavender color. Those regions are the variable. They can actually become tailor fit. How antibodies work, they're very particular to the antigen they're trying to target. They're very particular to what they're trying to target. So if you have an antigen that looks like this, the antibody should be able to recognize that particular pattern. It will not recognize this. It won't recognize this. It will only recognize the particular pattern that it was raised for because antibodies typically take about five to seven days to be made by the plasma cells and during that time you have that that tailor fit structure being made so that variable region will then become specifically tailored for the antigen that is trying to fight so example if you got the flu vaccine against h1n1 a particular strain you will produce antibodies that will detect, detect that particular strain. So let's say the flu strain that was going around was H3N2. That's a completely different strain of the virus. So the antibodies would not recognize that. I just gave that as an example so you can see how specific they can be. All right. And we, so we have that variable portion. We also have this portion down here, which is known as the FC, um, FC or the constant portion, okay? Constant. So there is a FAB portion. This whole part at the top is called FAB. This part is called FC. And when um, antibodies attach on to a foreign invader, this variable region is what attaches, and this is the part that sticks out. Now, I do want to mention something to you. Um, I always ask my students this question, do antibodies kill? So I'm going to ask you that question, do antibodies kill? And the answer is no, antibodies do not kill, okay? What antibodies do is to hold on so they neutralize okay they hold on or neutralize its target so if you have a toxin so let's say this is a toxin that is going to damage your cell and here it is looking really mad wanting to go attack your cell if you have antibodies that are attached to it okay see antibodies are attached it no longer can go and target your cell. 
All right, so it neutralizes. This is almost like a handcuff. If there was a robber that was running out to try to rob a place and you have a cop that handcuffed the hands and feet of that robber, that robber can no longer do anything. So that's how antibodies work. They neutralize, they hold on, they don't necessarily kill. Who kills it are actually the antigen presenting cells. They will come along and ingest um, what has been bounded to by the antibodies. Okay, so immunoglobulins, remember, is the same thing as antibodies, okay? We do have five um, classes of antibodies. Now, I do want to mention to you that immunoglobulins can class switch. So what I mean by class switch is that it can start out as one earlier on, but then it can switch to another type later on. So we call that class switching. So the different classes of immunoglobulins we have, we'll start out here, is IgA. Ig means immunoglobulin. So immunoglobulin A, they're more found in the mucosal linings. They're found in saliva tears, breast milk, um, and they're actually important. If you look at their structure, they're more of a dimeric form. So you have one here and one here. Now, one thing that this picture is not showing is a structure like that called the secretory component. And what this does, it actually adds protection to the IgA because the IgA are going to be in some hostile environments like the stomach. If this wasn't protected, you will have acids eroding it. You'll have enzymes breaking it down because antibodies are proteins. All right, so this IgA is designed specifically to be in those areas. All right, the next one is IgD. Now, those there's still some questions to circulate around it. We know it's part of the B cell receptor. And there is some role in activation of the basophil and mast cells. So they may have a certain role in allergies, but that's not its main role. There's still a lot of things being studied about it. The next one is IgE. This type we know is responsible for allergic reactions, okay? And it also is provides some form of protection against certain types of parasites. And so this is what the structure looks like. It doesn't really look a lot different looking at these pictures. Now, IgG, I'm gonna star that one. That one is the most abundant one that is made by your plasma cells that's sent out into the blood. So if you were to get a vaccine, you will have high levels of IgG in your blood. If you caught an infection, you most likely have high levels of IgG that would be circulating in your blood during the battle. Um, they are also able to cross the placenta to the fetus or to the baby. And this is what it looks like. Now, if an infection was persistent, remember I said that they can class switch. Um, what will you see in a more chronic infection, an infection that has been existing um, for a little bit, we will see more IgGs than anything else. Now, this one, the IgM, I love the IgMs. They're the ones that respond quite early in the immune stage, in the immunity um, properties. I want you to take a look at it. They have five arms. Each of these arms can hold on to an antigen. This is the one that kind of pops up first. And this is a good one to pop up first because if you're really, your body's really into that war fighting something, you want as much arms possible grabbing on. So earlier on in the infection, you see the IgM. But as the infection goes along, as time goes, it will switch out. It will not stay as IgM and most likely switch to IgG, okay? Because you remember they can class switch. Now, how does this apply? If someone got sick and they had, they went to the hospital really, really ill, and they check the antibody levels, and they see that they have high levels of IgM, they know it's a more recent infection. But if they don't see IgM and they see a lot more IgG, that indicates that that infection 
is a little bit longer than recent. It's been going on for a little bit longer. All right, so IgM is kind of like the first on the scene. So just to recap, we have IgA, IgD, IgE, IgG, and IgM. Okay, so let's talk about immune responses. So when uh, antigen or initial exposure has occurred, from the time it takes to develop an antibody response or to get the antibodies going and to clear the infection, can t well, to clear an infection can take about a month, okay? But to actually get that antibody being produced can take about five to seven days. It can even take about... 10 days to actually get the antibody response. If you look at the concentration of the antibody um, that is circulating, um, you do get a response, but I want you to notice after the infection is cleared, the uh, concentration of antibody doesn't go all the way down like how it was initially. And the reason why we see that is because antibody, the B cells, when your B cells are being produced, a subset of your B cells will go to make memory B cells. Okay, memory B cells. So the memory B cells will last as long as you live. And if you had exposure to that same antigen, if that same foreign entity came into your body, you will have an immediate response. Okay, so Let's talk about that second time you got exposed to it. Because you remember the first time you developed that immune response and then now you have your memory B cells. All right, I want you to take a look at how long it took if that same antigen got into your body again. Remember, there was kind of like this lag phase and you didn't get as many antibodies as you see here. In the second response, you probably wouldn't have a clue that that foreign entity got into your body because your response to antibody production goes up quite significantly and quite fast. And the reason why we see that in the secondary response is because you have memory B cells. Okay, so the last thing I do want to talk about are the different types of immunity you can acquire. All right, so you can have, we already spoke about innate, so I'm not going to talk about that right now. I'm talking about adaptive. For the adaptive immunity, you can have a natural immunity or an artificial. So let me explain. So for natural, you can have natural passive. So this, mean, this means that antibodies are naturally produced in a person. Okay, so they can acquire something, they produce antibodies. And that antibody can be passed on to another being. So example, if I was pregnant and I had my baby, right? While I was pregnant, the antibodies that are being passed from me to my baby is a form of natural passive, is being passed on. Just like in breast milk, you also have antibodies that are passed from, in breast milk from mother to child. That is natural passive. Now, there's another form called natural active. That's when you actively have gotten sick, you acquired the infection, you got sick, and you made those antibodies. So an example is, let's say I caught the flu, right? After my body is battling, I create antibodies against the flu. So I naturally got it, and I produce antibodies. So at this point, I have a natural active immunity against that infection, okay? Now let's take a look at this artificial route. I'll start off talking about artificial active. Okay, artificial active is you're actively making antibodies against something foreign, but how you acquired it was a, not natural. So I mean like if for the flu virus, I could inhale in the virus, and if I inhale in the virus, I make antibodies. That is natural active. But what I'm talking about here with artificial active is an example if I got the flu shot, right? The flu shot is not the natural route of getting the flu virus or the flu antigens, but I will still make antibodies against it. So I got it through an artificial route. So immunization is a prime example of that. And we have artificial passive. Now, remember, passive means it's being transferred from 
one organism to another. In this case of artificial passive, you have antibodies that's raised or made in another animal. And those antibodies are passed on to you to neutralize something. So a perfect example of that is um, anti-venom. If someone got bitten by a rattlesnake, you know, the venom is very poisonous. It can kill somebody. So the purpose of the anti-venom is to actually neutralize the toxin or the venom that's produced. But the, here's the thing, the antibodies that's raised against the venom was raised maybe in another animal like a horse. You're just using their antibodies. So these are the different types of immunity. All right, so quiz time. Let's go through this and see what you recall. What are the two divisions of adaptive immunity? What are the two divisions of adaptive immunity? That is cell-mediated, all right, which are T-cells, and humoral responses, which are B-cells. Okay, so what are the two major cell types in the cell-mediated response? Give the alternative names. So remember that these cell types have receptors, and that's how we also name them. So if we take a look, the answer is helper T-cells. They have CD4 receptors, so we also call them CD4 cells. Then we have our cytotoxic T-cells. They have CD8 receptors. So we also call them CD8 cells. So the cell-mediated response are looking at T cells. How are CD4 cells activated? So once again, you remember CD4 cells have CD4 receptors. They are the same thing as helper T cells. Antigen-presenting cells are who will stimulate the helper T cells to become activated. So they use that process of co-stimulation. You remember the antigen presenting cell has on its surface the MHC receptors, okay? And the MHC receptor will display on its surface antigens. And then you'll have your T cells, um, the helper T cell that will also have its receptors, so here's the T cell, that will interact. And when that happens, you will get co-stimulation signals and the antigen presenting cells will send out chemicals to activate it, to wake it up. So that's how the CD cell, CD4 cells are activated. What do helper T cells activate? So once the helper T cells become activated, what do they activate? Well, they activate all the other cells of the adaptive immune system. So they activate other helper T cells, they activate cytotoxic T cells, and they also activate B cells. Okay, so we spoke about helper T cells. Even though I didn't ask the question, hopefully you remember what the cytotoxic T cells do. Okay, remember the cytotoxic T cells, they kill virally infected cells. They kill um, cells that have intracellular pathogens in it, and they also kill cancer cells. So even though I didn't ask it, I just wanted you to know one that helper T cells activate the cytotoxic T cells. That's what they do. What are B cells called when they are activated and what do they produce? So remember, um, the B cells have to be activated by the helper T cells. And when they're active, they become plasma cells, okay? And when they become plasma cells, they produce antibodies, also known as immunoglobulins. What are the different immunoglobulins? For first of all, how many do we have, all right? So if you said we have five, you are correct. So let's go down here. What are the different immunoglobulins? We have IgM, IgA, IgE, I, I mean IgG, IgE, IgM. Remember the most abundant one is IgG. The first one on the scene is IgM. The IgA is found in the mucosal linings. IgE is responsible for allergies, okay? Oh, this one is actually supposed to be IgD, not IgM, okay, IgD. Okay. Why does the secondary immune response occur so quickly regarding Ig production? So remember the secondary response is if you before you had exposure, 
in the primary response, like let's say a virus got into your body, you produce antibodies towards it, that's your primary response. The secondary response is if that same virus got into your body, you get a quick response. So why does that quick response occur in the secondary immune response? Well, after a primary response, a subset of B cells become memory B cells. And those memory B cells will last as long as you live. So if that same pathogen comes in again, it quickly responds to that target. And it doesn't need that long five to seven to even 10 days to be produced. And you get a lot more of it. So that's amazing. Immunization is an example of what type of immunity. Remember, there was the artificial and the natural immunities, and they had their own divisions. If you said artificial active, then you are correct. So hopefully you got 100 on this quiz. This was a very basic and fundamental quiz. Please let me know what you learned or how you did on the quiz. I would love to hear from you. So until next time, bye.